Crystal is uh, very pleased uh, to present our first ever report on the state of the nation covering the economy, sectors and companies. We believe that this report represents a truly unique analysis because as you will see it combines in a very interesting way top-down analysis with bottom-up analysis. And I think this is something that we felt was very important because, as you all know, the economy and issues relating to the economy are very much at the forefront of the agenda and very much at the top of the mind today, with a whole lot of opinions, uh, perspectives, analysis on different aspects being put out by a range of uh, uh, commentators. Uh, what we felt, therefore, was that there's no better time than this to, for the first time, put out something that is objective, that is based on facts, and that is very comprehensive. And we felt that we are the best position to do this, given the wealth of the data and information that we have in the company. Consider the fact that we rate almost 50,000 small and medium enterprises. Uh, we rate 12,500 companies on our traditional rating scale. We do an analysis of 70 industries, and we have a great macroeconomic research research team. Uh, so we felt that it was a great time and a great opportunity to leverage the expertise and the understanding and indeed most importantly the data to put out something that is based on facts and, and based uh, uh, and, and, and very objective. So what you will see in our analysis is that uh, we point out the challenges. Uh, very interestingly, we also disprove uh, several uh, commonly held perceptions uh, with the use of data and we'll share some of those findings with you and we throw some lights on the positives that we are seeing today. Uh, what we thought we would do is I will just make a very brief presentation for about 45 minutes or so, uh, for about 15 minutes or so, and then the balance time of 45 minutes uh, we will leave uh, for a Q&A session. So we would welcome your questions, so I'll keep my presentation uh, brief. So let me move on. So this analytical exercise, as I said, is a unique one which combines together macro as well as micro perspectives. And let me explain how we went about doing this. We first started with our universe of investment grade rated companies. That is, we took the 2,481 companies that Crystal rates investment grade and above, which is triple B minus and above. What is the significance of this universe? The significance of this universe is one, that it is very large. Two, it practically covers every sector and every industry in the economy. Three, it represents a sizable chunk of banking sector exposure. So these companies alone account for 32% of the exposure or the corporate exposure of the Indian banking system. And four, they account for almost 82% of crystal rated debt. So because of these factors, we felt that any analysis and any insight that we get from this, this population uh, of companies will be very significant and will offer great inputs for us to build on what the implications of this are for sectors as well as for the macroeconomy. The next thing we brought into play was our Crystal research uh, understanding and analytics. As you know, the research business is separate from our ratings business and what we do in this business is carry out research on 70 different sectors in the economy. And this research is based on very strong on the ground inputs from almost 4,000 contacts that we have. And who are these contacts? They are the players in the sectors themselves they are the vendors, they are the distributors, they are the lenders, and they are industry associations. So the second bit that we, that we really brought into this analysis was our, uh, was our industry perspective. 
And finally, the analysis contains a very strong overlay of our macroeconomic research capabilities. We have a very, very strong macroeconomic uh, center for economic research and our strong understanding of risk. So this is what the analysis really combines to present a very holistic picture of the economic state of India today. And let me just explain with one example, a very small example, how we have gone up, how this analysis works. So, you know, when we did the study of the 2,481 companies, what we found, interestingly, was that the biggest source of stress uh, for these companies uh, was demand slowdown. It was not forex, it was not liquidity, but it was demand slowdown. So that was a very important insight that we got from the company analysis. The interesting insight that we got from the sector analysis is that two out of three sectors will experience lower revenue growth. So both these inputs we put together and and they were a very key, uh, key input that went into our industry uh, forecast or overall industry GDP forecast of 1%. And bear in mind that earlier we were working with numbers of 3.5% or so as indeed everyone else was. But I think the insights that we got from the company analysis and the sector analysis played a very big role in us bringing down that number for industrial growth to 1%. So this is how the analysis works. Uh, before I move on to the findings, uh, two, three observations. Uh, our company analysis was very focused. What we set out to do was to say, we believe that there are five sources of stress that companies can face. And what are these five sources of stress? The first is the vulnerability to demand slowdown. The second is Forex the forex volatility. The third is the extent of debt or the level of indebtedness of the firms. The fourth is the ability of the firms to service this debt in terms of their ability to meet their interest obligations and therefore what is the amount of cash that they will generate in relation to the interest payments and debt servicing requirements that they have. And uh, the fifth uh, source of, of uh, stress was uh, liquidity pressures. So the company analysis was very specific. How vulnerable is each of these 2,481 companies to each of these five sources of stress? So that is what we focused on in the company analysis. What did we focus on in the industry analysis? In the industry analysis, we focus mainly on two things. One is what rate will the industry grow at? Uh, was the prime area of focus. And the second area of focus was what will the margins or the profitability of this industry look like? Uh, so those were the two areas of focus. And when it came to the macro economy, uh, I think our focus was uh, typically on the traditional macroeconomic indicators, whether it be forecasting GDP, uh, forex, interest rates, fiscal deficit, and the like. So when we put all this analysis together, the next question was how do we present this analysis? You know, it's so sweep, so vast in its sweep. It is so detailed. And how do we present it in a manner that makes sense or that is easy to understand? And then we hit upon, um, you know, the movie from the 60s, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we use that framework really to present the key findings of our analysis. So you will find that the report that we have with you is organized into this framework of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And in my presentation, in the next three slides that I have, that's all I have in this presentation, I will walk you through the, through the good, what's, what do we see as the good, what do we see as the bad, and what do we see as the ugly. Starting with the good, I think the, the first is agriculture. We have had timely monsoons, we have had well distributed monsoons and we have seen an increase of about almost 7%, that 6.8% in the Kharif sowing area. All this leads us to believe that agricultural GDP could accelerate to as much as 4.5%, which is more than double of what we saw last year at 1.9%. And I think agriculture 
provides the single most positive upside uh, to the economic picture today. Uh, what this will result in is, uh, is a checking of food inflation. It will importantly also result in a boost in rural consumption. And therefore, we are expecting to see an uptake in the demand for tractors, two-wheelers, and the like, which are very linked to rural consumption. So for tractors, for example, to give you, give you a feel, we are forecasting that growth rate will go up from between 16% to 18%, whereas last year they actually declined by 2%. Similarly, if you look at, uh, at two-wheelers, we are forecasting that the growth rate will be 4% to 6% in this fiscal, whereas last year it was only 2.9%. So these are good strong examples of industries or sectors that will see the positive fallout of, of, of a good agricultural um, uh, of, of a good agricultural scenario. The second positive uh, uh, is, is really the boost for exports. We have a currency that has significantly depreciated. Uh, we have a global context which is steadily improving. I think growth in, the, in America is becoming firmer. Uh, we see uh, unexpected surprises in the European region as well, be it Germany, be it Britain. Uh, and all these, the, the, the positivity that you see in the global economic environment combined with the improved competitiveness because of the depreciation of the currency augur well for exports in general. And we saw that in the numbers that came out yesterday. But specifically within exports, I think those sectors which do not depend on imports uh, will, do, will do much better. And therefore, the four sectors that we have identified, which we believe will really lead the pack as far as exports are concerned in terms of growth, are IT and ITES. Uh, pharmaceuticals, textiles, and leather. And obviously a good export scenario combined with what we believe will be muted imports because of the slowdown in the economy will lead to a positive impact on both the trade deficit and the current account deficit. We are in fact forecasting a significant reduction in the current account deficit from a level of 4.8% uh, last year to 3.9% this year. That is our forecast. And the third factor in the good is, uh, is a really surprising insight that we got from our analysis of the 2,481 companies. Of the five stress factors that I talked about, uh, what this analysis showed was that Forex vulnerability is the lead of the stress factors. And it impacts only 6% of the firms that we analyzed. Let me give you a little insight into this because there are some caveats that we need to put out. So if you look at the total foreign exchange debt of corporate India today, it is 200 billion US dollars. These 2,500 companies that we have looked at account for about half of that. So the total forex debt sitting on the books of these companies is about uh, 100 billion US dollars. Out of uh, what is also very interesting is how concentrated this debt is. So all this debt, 85% of this debt is actually sitting on the books of just 1% of these companies. So the vast majority of the companies that we looked at really don't have this debt. So this 85% is sitting on the books of 1% of the companies. And we said let's do a holistic analysis. Let's not just look at what the debt on the books is, or the forex debt on the books is. Let us look at what are their receivables in foreign exchange, let us look at what their payables in foreign exchange are, and let us look at how much of the forex exposure these companies have hedged. So if you take the forex debt and you add to that the receivables, subtract from that the payables, and deduct from that the hedged positions, the net forex exposure of these companies works out to $98 billion. Uh, so that is the, that is the number uh, that is the number that we worked with. So very interesting to see that you know the, the impact of the currency volatility is being felt in only six percent of this universe. It's very important for me to also highlight one caveat at this point, which is that 
I, I, I mentioned that the 100 billion of debt that we looked at, uh, the, the, hundred, the, the companies that we looked at account for only 100 billion of debt. The balance 100 billion, uh, a large part of it also is on groups that Crystal does not rate, which have significant forex exposure, and these are SR, GVK, GMR, G Jindal's, uh, JP, and Videocon. So our analysis, uh, because we don't rate many of the companies in this, the, our analysis does not include these groups, and that's a caveat that we need to need to highlight. But overall, I think this was one pretty interesting and pretty surprising finding of the study, uh, which I would say actually goes against popular perception. So, so much for the good. I would say these are the three good factors, agriculture, exports, and forex vulnerability on companies being lower than what we had thought it would be. Let us now move on to the second part, which is the bad, and what are some of the insights that we get from our study. The first is obviously we expect inflation to remain high this year. Our forecast for inflation this year is 6.2%. Uh, and this is on account of the surging crude oil prices and the weaker rupee. What does this mean? We believe that on account of inflation remaining high, it will be difficult for the Reserve Bank of India to make rate cuts going forward, uh, uh, given their, commit their, their, their statement that their primary commitment is to containing inflation. And therefore, the stress in leverage sectors or sectors which have high level of debt today, whether it is infrastructure or or whether it is real estate will continue. The second point in the bad, bad is really that given the fact that we are seeing a slowdown in the economy and government's tax revenues are under pressure, you again have, given the fact that you have a very high level of oil subsidies which are expected to increase, we believe that there will be slippages in the fiscal position. Against a forecast of a budgeted number of 4.8%, we are forecasting a fiscal deficit of 5.2%. What this means is is that given the government's stated commitment to reining in the fiscal deficit as much as possible, it will be difficult for, for the government to come out with, provide any financial stimulus to the economy uh, in the manner they did in the post-Lehman uh, period. The third, uh, uh, the third point in the bad is really services. Uh, services have been the mainstay of our economic growth in the last decade, and we've seen numbers consistently uh, in the region of 10% over the last decade. That number, we are saying, will now come down to 6.5%. And the reason we are saying that is today the linkage between industry and services has significantly increased compared to, uh, compared to what the position was 20 years ago. So if you looked at the situation 20 years ago in India, to produce one unit of industrial output, you needed 0.36 units of services. Today, to produce one unit of industrial output, uh, the, the, the service component that goes into it is 0.44. You need 0.44 units. So really, the linkage between industry and services um, has, has significantly uh, increased or tightened, be it areas like uh, hospital, be it areas like, sorry, hospitality, uh, hotels, restaurants, be it, uh, um, uh, you know, things like even banking services, all these are very closely linked to industrial growth. And because industrial growth is coming down to 1%, as we have forecast, we are forecasting services to come down to 6.5%. And the final point in the bad is really, uh, uh, our analysis on the liquidity of companies. What did we do and how did we go about looking at the liquidity of companies? We looked at three things. We looked at how much debt is coming up in each of these companies for repayment within the next 12 months. That is the first thing that we looked at. Second thing that we looked at was uh, what is happening to working capital? Are receivables getting stretched? Is in are inventory levels piling up? Because that is the second source of liquidity problems. And the third thing we looked at is what are the capital expenditure plans of the company in relation to the net worth of the company? So this is what went into our liquidity analysis. And we found that liquidity will be a source of stress for 60 
16% of the companies that we have analyzed. What is even more interesting is that, again, contrary to popular perception, large companies will be affected more than the smaller companies. So when we define large companies, we have defined them as companies with a turnover of greater than 1,000 crores. So whereas overall in this 2,400-odd companies, 16% of the firms will be stressed by liquidity pressures, for large companies, that number goes up to 27%. And that is primarily because of stretched working capital cycles. So, so much for the bad. Now let me move on to the final part, which is uh, the ugly. Uh, I think the first point to highlight here is out of all the five stress factors that Crystal analyzed, clearly demand slowdown is the one that is hurting the most. Two out of the three sectors that we looked at, we believe will experience a lower revenue growth compared to last year. And the vulnerability to demand slowdown remains the most important source of stress for one quarter of the companies. 25% of the companies are going to be vulnerable to a demand slowdown. So that's pretty significant. Again here, what is very interesting is that the impact on large companies will be higher than the impact on smaller companies. Uh, both because of the fact that uh, they have higher levels of indebtedness and because it will affect the lower, the lower revenue growth will affect their ability to service uh, uh, debt in the cushion available to service debt in the form of interest cover. So while uh, the vulnerability to demand slowdown remains a source of stress for 25% of the companies overall, the larger firms, where the larger firms are concerned, more than 30% of them uh, are stressed by higher indebtedness and by stress on their interest cover. The second part in the, in the ugly is that industrial growth will remain quite anemic. We talked about the 1% number and we gave you some flavor of the kind of analysis that went into computing this 1% number. The investment climate also continues to be challenged uh, and we believe that therefore the, the worst affected sectors will be the infrastructure and the infrastructure related sectors, capital goods, real estate, automobiles and transport operators. So I think these would be amongst all the sectors that we look at, the, the, the five sectors which are the worst hit. And finally, on, uh, on, on still on the ugly, I think uh, the current account deficit will remain a cause for concern. Yes, we are expecting an improvement. We are expecting the current account deficit to decline uh, to 3.9% from 4.8% uh, last year. Uh, we therefore believe that the rupee could rebound uh, to, 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 to 60 rupees to the US dollar. But nevertheless, compared to the last fiscal the currency will remain severely, significantly depreciated by about 12 to 14 percent compared to what it was last year. And what the implications of this are are pretty obvious. There will be, it will put an upward pressure on inflation, it will put an uh, pressure on input costs for companies, and it will also pressurize the fiscal deficit. So these are the 10 key findings which, which we have grouped into the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's a wealth of analysis uh, uh, behind each of this which, uh, in, in the reports that have been handed out to you. And finally, you know, what is all this adding up to? And what does all this mean? So I think what we are saying in, in, in totality is that all this put together means that we are looking at a GDP growth rate uh, which is at a decadal low of 4.8%. Bear in mind though that agriculture could still surprise even beyond what we have projected. We have projected a 4.5% growth in agriculture, but if India gets lucky and agricultural growth goes up to 6%, uh, you, we've actually seen that happen in 2010-2011 when it went up to 7.9%. In such a scenario, uh, GDP growth could come out much better at 5.2%. 
And assuming, however, that our most likely scenario of 4.8% plays out, what this means is that the Indian economy will stay in an L-shaped trajectory, which is very different from the V-shaped recovery that we saw after the Lehman crisis. Uh, thank you very much.